Welcome to Train Signal. You're watching a lesson on security devices. Now, as I've mentioned before, when it comes to computer networking and the security aspects of it, well, there's many of them. And in this lesson, we're going to focus specifically on certain devices. And when I say devices, I don't necessarily mean physically hardware devices, but different devices and mechanisms that we can use to help keep our networks secure. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, when it comes to security devices, I will tell you that the first and foremost device that we need to talk about is something called a firewall. Now, this is a term that I'm going to bet you've probably heard of before. I think most people have. And that's because a firewall is so common in so many areas of computers and computer networking. In today's world, they're, they're vital. And if I'm going to give an overly simplified definition of what a firewall is, it is something that is used to control the flow of data. Now, I'm going to keep it that simple, and I'm not going to get specific into what data and where it's controlling the flow to. And the reason why is because firewalls come in many different shapes and sizes. So first of all, I will tell you that a firewall can either be a hardware device, so you may have an actual firewall box, you know, an actual physical device that you go out and buy as a firewall. Or the firewall can also be software built into the operating system or software that you install on your computer. And I will also tell you that when it comes to the controlling of the flow of data, and I said I'm not going to get specific with it, well, I want to tell you that firewalls can also be host-based which means they're protecting the flow of data in and out of an individual host or an individual computer, or they can be network-based, meaning that you are controlling the flow of data in and out of your network. Now, as far as how firewalls work, you know, how does this data control, you know, this flow control, how does it actually work? Well, firewalls work by establishing a set of rules. And I will tell you that these rules very often, uh, the, you know, mo the most common kind of rule has to do with the opening or closing of certain ports. Okay, we've talked about ports in different lessons in this course, and the ports very often are associated with different protocols. And if data is trying to come in or go out on a certain port, the firewalls will determine whether that port is open or closed for data to be able to travel through it. And I will tell you that it's not a matter of that port being open for both directions or closed in both directions. These rules will determine you know, specifics for inbound traffic or outbound traffic, or it could be to control both directions. Okay, You can get very specific with these rules. I can also tell you that the rules can be established based upon things other than just ports. Uh, we've talked about other types of filtering in other lessons where we can establish whether data can travel through, uh, in this case, a firewall, based upon the specific computer it's coming from, or what user is attempting to send the data through the firewall. There are very, very specific rules as far as uh, when it comes down to certain times of day and, and other details like that. Now, in general, once you set up these rules, I will tell you that there are two main ways of running your firewall. The first is to say that I'm going to allow everything to pass through except what I explicitly say cannot go through. Okay, this, That's why I have up here explicit deny. In other words, data can flow through this firewall all it wants to unless I've explicitly said no, that particular traffic does not get through. So that's one approach when it comes to your rules. As you say, everything's open, and I'll make specific rules of what doesn't get through. The other version is the exact opposite. It's block everything except for things that I say can get through. And this is what's called implicit deny, meaning by default, nothing's getting through this firewall unless I say it can. So if you're not on the list, if you're, if you're a piece of data that's trying to flow through this firewall and I don't see any rule that applies to you, 
Well, then you're not in because I'm blocking everything unless there's a rule that says you can get in. Okay, so keep that in mind that these are the two different approaches to setting up your firewall rules. And I will tell you that there are good and bad reasons for both. I mean, you really have to determine your environment and figure out which one makes the most sense. Because when you go with allow everything except for what I block, well, that's very convenient because stuff just works. You don't get a lot of users complaining that their stuff won't go through the firewall because everything gets through unless you've explicitly determined that that's something of danger and so you block it. But that's also obviously the less secure way of doing things. Now if you go the other direction where you say, I'm just going to block everything and if you want to pass through this firewall, you have to give me a reason to create a rule. Well, that's much more secure, but it's also a much greater nuisance. This is where you're going to have people who, even after you think you have your firewall set up correctly, uh, these people are going to come to you and say, I don't know what's going on, but I can't see the blah, blah, blah server, or I can't transmit this kind of data, or I can't get to this website, or whatever it might be. And you're thinking, well, I don't know why not. And then you're going to have to go look and see, oh, you know what? I didn't put you on the, the set of rules to let you do that. And so what's going to end up happening is, is you're going to spend time modifying those rules on a much more frequent basis as the needs of the business change. But again, remember, it's much more secure. So you have to kind of weigh the balance between the need for security and the need for convenience. And I will tell you that that is something you, you know, that's a very important role. To be a successful security administrator, you need to be very good at balancing that and understanding that it's not always just about security. Business has needs and you need to be able to meet those needs as well. Now, as I mentioned before, this is all done through the use of ACLs, which we've talked about in another lesson. With the access control list, we can determine whether these lists, you know, on these lists, what MAC addresses, IP addresses, ports, users, all sorts of crazy rules either explicitly do get in or explicitly don't get in. Now, there are some more advanced firewalls that have extended capabilities, which include things like stateful inspection and packet filtering. And what I'm going to tell you here is, first of all, that's not all. I mean, there are many different advanced capabilities that various firewalls are going to be able to perform for you as far as these different functionalities. But the idea here is some firewalls can even go to the levels of being able to look at the content within a given packet. Okay, whereas previously we were just talking about the packets being determined whether they get in or out based upon uh, mostly their header information, not the payload itself. Whereas stateful inspection and packet filtering is more of the idea of getting into the actual payload and based upon what the purpose of that packet is, really determining uh, in that way whether something gets through or not. Now another thing that firewalls can be used for is, is for the purposes of setting up something called a DMZ, which stands for Demilitarized Zone. It is also sometimes referred to as a screened subnet, and sometimes it's also referred to as a perimeter network. Whatever you want to call it, the idea behind it is that you create an additional buffer network, so to speak, which exists between your internal network and the internet. And so the idea here is that you may have certain servers or we'll just say certain systems that maybe you want to have accessible to the internet. A very good example would be a web server. Maybe you want to go ahead and have a web presence. It's a good idea in today's world, right? To go ahead and have a website. And so you have to have that web server, which is hosting the website. And this is a server you want to let people from the internet get to. But the problem is, if you just have a web server on your internal network and you use a single firewall to allow users to come in from the internet, and as long as they're coming in on the correct port, they can get to that web server. Well, here's the problem. As long as they come in on that port, they also have the possibility of getting to the rest of your internal network. That can be very dangerous. So by setting up the DMZ, you create the environment where they can go through a firewall to get to the web server, and you want to have that firewall to get to the web server. You know, because some people will ask me, why don't you just put your web server on the outside of the, of 
the one firewall that you have. Well, that's all fine and dandy when it comes to protecting your internal network, but what about protecting the web server? I mean, you still want to have some level of protection on that web server, so you have one firewall for that purpose, but then in order to get past the network that the web server's on and get to your internal network, you'd have to pass through another firewall. And very often, the way these firewalls will be set up, you'll have different ports open so that the port they're coming in to get to your web server is not a valid port to get to your internal network. Another method that is used here, if you are truly using two separate firewalls like I have illustrated here, is you might use two different manufacturers or two different technologies of firewall. That way if somebody has gotten wise and has figured out how to hack your firewall, great, they hacked the outside firewall and hopefully before they figure out how to hack through the completely separate firewall that you have on the inside, you'll notice that they're roaming around in your DMZ. Now, another way of setting up a DMZ is you can do it with what's called a multi-homed firewall, where it's really just one firewall, but it has three network cards, one that connects to the internet, one that connects to the DMZ, and one that connects to your internal network. And so the processing of having a completely separate network is not physical like I have illustrated here, but it's done logically with the software. So now that we know about firewalls, right, because that's, like I said in the beginning, that is the first and foremost, most you know, primary uh, device that you need to know when it comes to security, let's talk about some other security devices that you should be aware of to keep your network secure. First, we have something called an intrusion detection system, or an IDS. And just like with the firewall, an IDS can be either host-based, meaning you're doing your intrusion detection on a single computer, or it can be network-based. But the idea behind it is that it is used to help an administrator recognize a possible attack. And again, the breakdown is it can be for your entire network or for an individual system. Now, with an IDS, what it's doing is it's looking for certain patterns of activity. And if it sees a, a, a pattern of activity that typically represents an attack, or it's very similar to an attack, then what it will do is it will typically notify the administrator. Whereas there's another type of device that's very similar, and that's called an intrusion prevention system, or IPS, where it works just like an IDS. And again, the breakdown is, is it can be for the network or it could be for an individual system. But here's the difference. When it recognizes the potential harmful activity, besides just notifying the administrator, it can proactively make changes to lock down and lock out the potential intruder. Now again, just like we've talked about with other things, there is good and bad that goes with this. The good is that rather than you, the administrator, having to be alerted, and then by the time you get involved and you make a change, you know, with the IDS, the, the intruder may have already done what they want to do, the IPS is going to automatically do things on your behalf. So it's consider to be more secure, but if you are in an environment that presents what's called false positives, okay, in other words, you have an actual legitimate function taking place in your network, but it looks like an attack, well, now your IPS is going to possibly inconvenience people on your network because it's going to lock things down when there wasn't really an attack taking place, and then legitimate workers cannot perform legitimate functions. So, Keep in mind that you again have to weigh the differences between security and business needs or convenience. Now another type of security device is something called a VPN concentrator, which is basically a hardware-based VPN server. Okay, so we talked about VPNs or virtual private networks in another lesson. This is a hardware-based VPN server, which will be used to set up your secure VPN connection with the remote client before passing them through to your internal network. So it's the idea of setting up this secure connection before getting into your network. Whereas typically without the VPN concentrator, a user will actually connect to your internal network and then once they're in the network, the VPN server would determine whether they're allowed in to the rest of the network or not. And obviously that creates a little bit of a security vulnerability. Now I want to talk to you about a couple of 
vulnerability scanners because this is another way of helping to protect your network or another type of device that you can use to protect your network. And the idea is that, you know, yes, scanners are used for the purposes of, you know, by the bad guys. The bad guys will scan your network. But you can also, as the person who's trying to protect your network, use scanners to see where there are potential threats, or really we should say vulnerabilities. Uh, the threats are when you determine, you know, what are the actual threats that are coming into your network. The vulnerability is how they're getting in. So the first one is Nessus, N-E-S-S-U-S, -S which is a comprehensive vulnerability scanning program which will detect potential vulnerabilities on your various systems. Okay, so just understand that this thing is out there and it's there so that you can look for these vulnerabilities and help find them rather than waiting to, to see somebody has broken into your network and you go, oh, well, this is how they got in. Another one is called NMAP, okay, N-M-A-P. This is a security scanner that will go through and discover various hosts and services on your network so as to create a map of that network, thus the name NMAP as in network map. It creates a map of your network so that you can see everything. Because, you know, sometimes, even when you're very organized, you go through, you put your network together very carefully, but first of all, you're not always the only person involved, so that's the first problem. And second of all, even when you're very well organized, eh, you forget about things. Things change. Something accidentally didn't get documented. So NMAP is a great way to put this whole thing together for you so that you can see where uh, there are potential vulnerabilities. Uh, maybe you have certain systems in a certain area on your network, and you say, aha, I need to make sure to lock that down. Now, this is uh, a, a real fun part for me. I always like talking about a couple of these security methods that you can use called honeypots and honey nets. And the idea behind this is that this is a trap that you will set up that basically allows a potential attacker to come in Okay, so it's, it's a trap that you set up so that the attacker comes in and then you, the administrator, can analyze how exactly they're getting in. So the idea is they, they get in, right? you have your potential attacker, they've come in, and you set up this honeypot, which is sometimes a, a fake system, but you, it's a fake system that has just enough information to keep the attacker interested so that while they're in there messing around, you can look at it and go, how did they get in here and what are they doing? And the hunting net is an entire network of systems that you set up with, again, you have these intentional vulnerabilities, right? You, you give yourself the, the you really, you give your attacker the ability to come on in so that you can trap them and you take a look at how they're doing it so that you can then protect yourself. So I, I love the idea of going ahead and setting up these traps for the attackers. And so that brings us to the end of this lesson where we've seen that there are many different security devices and mechanisms that we can use to help keep our networks secure. Now remember, your primary defense is going to be your firewalls. I mean, that's why we spent so much time on it. But beyond the firewalls, there are a number of other different devices that you can put in place that will help you really, you know, what it is, is it's kind of helping you keep an eye on the network. So hopefully your networks will be just a little bit more secure from this point forward. And with that, that's all I got, and I'll see you in the next lesson.